Welcome to our Virginia Mason Institute webinar, the first in our Leadership Through Crisis interview series. Virginia Mason Institute is a mission-driven nonprofit education and training organization that helps organizations worldwide create cultures of continuous improvement. My name is Tad Aquat, and I'm pleased to introduce my colleague, Christopher Backus, who will be hosting today's webinar. Chris Backus is a senior transformation sensei here at Virginia Mason Institute. He leads improvement activities, workshops, and training for healthcare leaders and providers worldwide. By embedding methods into the lean concepts he teaches, he works with clients to unlock the revolutionary thinking necessary to transform healthcare. Prior to joining Virginia Mason Institute, Chris led the integration of lean methods into the design of Virginia Mason's 350,000 square foot hospital edition, the first environment of its kind to be built from the ground up using the Virginia Mason production system. He also led numerous improvement events using lean tools and methods to improve healthcare processes. Chris is certified in the Virginia Mason production system and 3P production preparation process facilitation. Today, Chris will be interviewing Dr. Gary Kaplan. Dr. Kaplan is the chairman and chief executive officer of Virginia Mason Health System, serving in the role since 2000. Dr. Kaplan received a degree in medicine from the University of Michigan and is board certified in internal medicine. He completed his internal medicine residency at Virginia Mason and served as chief resident in 1980 to 1981. He is a fellow of the American College of Physicians, the American College of Medical Practice Executives, and the American College of Physician Executives, and is recognized as one of the most influential physician executives in healthcare. All right, thanks again for joining us today. Take it away, Chris. Thanks for that introduction. I'd like to talk about a few things before we get into the interview. Uh, the first thing we want to talk about is that we will reference the Virginia Mason strategic plan. As you can see here, our management method, the Virginia Mason production system, is at the foundation of our, manage, or of our strategic plan. And that's there deliberately to show that this is the way by which and through which everything is done in the organization that allows us to achieve our patient focus throughout the year to fulfill our mission to improve the health and well-being of the patients we serve and to achieve our vision of being a quality leader and sharing this information with uh, people like you to help transform healthcare across the world. You'll notice that on the strategic plan, we'll also be referencing the four strategic pillars. The people pillar will be talking about respect for people, our pursuit of quality both in crisis and through moving through the crisis back to normal operations. You'll hear an amazing story of service uh, that our nurses have been able to really focus on the patient and family experience through crisis, which also links to our platform on innovation that allows us to think differently every day to use our management method, encounter problems, work through those problems, and actually implement quickly. So Dr. Kaplan will also be referencing some of the most important elements of transformation today. The first that you see at the top here is the importance of having uh, an improvement method that the organization uses and aligning that improvement method, not just a toolkit for people to use, but there's a good why purpose, good sense of why in the work. So leaders with a, an agreed upon sense of urgency, we know that the COVID-19 crisis was an immediate call to action, but in, in many ways, since the beginning of the Virginia Mason production system, we've been developing our method for over 18 years and we're to be ready for this moment. The importance of visible, visible and committed leaders throughout the day, um, setting the vision, setting the plan, listening to the experts both within the organization and externally to make sure that we were doing the right things and communicating face to face to offer that reassurance to our staff throughout the organization. Making sure that the vision for the organization in caring for our patients, respecting our people, making sure that everyone had what they needed when they needed it in, in order to uh, do our best work each and every day. And also the aligned expectations of being able to succeed as an organization in caring for our patients in the crisis and now through the crisis as we begin to return to a more normal operations. The 
alignment that Dr. Kaplan will be speaking about today also includes the connection from our strategic long-term vision through five-year plans that set priority uh, through the organization, annual goals that are then built from our strategic focus, department level goals that are set to align to the annual goals and, and strategic areas of focus for the organization, all the way down to individual employees in the organization, setting both uh, performance goals for themselves, development goals for themselves, and also the making sure that the work that they're doing is connecting back to the areas of strategic focus for the organization. So these are just a few elements that you'll hear referenced throughout our interview today. I just want to make sure you had that framing before we launched into the interview. And with that, we'll get started on the interview. Well, hello, Gary. How are you today? Hi, Chris. Good to see you. It's great to see you. So I appreciate your time and this opportunity just to reflect on Virginia Mason's response to the COVID-19 crisis and some of the lessons learned about the organization, our people, and our method, the Virginia Mason production system. And so appreciate your time. Uh, I'd like to start with some questions from the audience. Um, the first question was, um, what has it been like day to day responding to COVID-19 at Virginia Mason? Well, in, in many ways, it's, uh, it's been similar to how we work every day and that uh, uh, our work uh, together to what we call our work together to create perfect patient experiences uh, is fast paced. Um, I think the stress uh, and the uncertainty and the change that comes with um, COVID-19 has been a great example of how a learning system, a learning organization uh, can function and thrive. For me personally, uh, I've, uh, uh, I've not been able to travel and some of you may know that I'm uh, periodically on the road and um, and being here, being present, uh, I think has had uh, a lot of impact uh, as we've gone forward. I think all of our leaders needing to be very present, very visible uh, has been critical. Perhaps we can talk more about that. Uh, but it's definitely been a change. And I've gotten to see our team uh, function under uh, intense pressure, uh, somewhat out of their element at times, because none of us have ever experienced uh, a situation just like uh, uh, that which we've experienced with the coronavirus and all of the implications for day-to-day -day patient care, uh, staff uh, well-being and uh, anxieties coupled with fierce determination to do great things for our patients. Mm -hmm. So it's been a, a very interesting time to say the least. Mm -hmm. One of the things, Gary, that uh, you often talk about is the importance and supporting a transformation for an organization is the importance of visible and committed leadership. And you just mentioned the impact of leader presence on the GEMBA or where the work is happening through COVID. Can you talk a bit more about that? Yeah, well, I think that uh, there's no question in our minds that um, while our management system, VMPS, uh, engages actively the frontline people, those closest to the work being those who understand the work the best and have the best and have the, the most uh, ideas and, uh, and identify, identification of opportunities for improvement. Uh, leadership is so important to setting the tone, setting the priorities, coaching, and uh, being uh, engaged on a daily basis. And what I've come to see is how important that is for senior leaders as well. This is not something that uh, we can just delegate to the next levels of management. People are watching us, uh, the most senior leaders in the organization. How do we behave? If we're saying people should wear masks, are we wearing masks? Uh, what are the behaviors that we are demonstrating? And, and then being available because as I mentioned, none of us have really uh, ever experienced anything like this. And so we're all learning together. And um, you can't learn in a vacuum. 
and you can't kind of step out and then step back in. So we're all in this together. Uh, from the moment we set up our command center, I have been very visible. That's different than micromanaging. I have to let my team, our team do our do their work. Uh, but I've been told by many of them that uh, they appreciate the fact that uh, our senior leaders are so engaged and so visible and so present. So I think, I think it's a real asset uh, every day, but particularly during these uh, challenging and uh, what for many are unsettling times. I've, um, I've heard people speak about uh, COVID-19 is daily sprints as part of a marathon. So it's like every day we're sprinting. And one of the um, listeners uh, had a question about leader resiliency. So what do you think um, Virginia Mason has done to help the leaders keep their focus and remain resilient through the, as you said, the day-to-day -day changes that the uh, pandemic has brought to us? Well, I think that's that's a work in progress. It's always a work in progress. How do we um, support our leaders? How do we surround our leaders with uh, talent and and support? Uh, how do we uh, tolerate uh, ambiguity? And how do we tolerate periodic failures? Because our leaders have to lead the uh, particularly in this organization, the notion of innovation, the no notion of we can always improve and always be better. Uh, and when you do that, you have to take some risk. And so uh, a tolerance for failure uh, in a way that is focused on what happens uh, and what are and harnessing, leveraging the learnings from those failures uh, helps create that climate. Uh, I think uh, Resilience is critically important. And that means that even in today's fast paced, uh, very uh, intense environment, we've got to carve out space for leaders to have their downtime. A great example is how we rotate our command center leadership. So we have one of our most senior executives partnered with a physician leader uh, on weekly intervals in the command center. And we have three teams and so they are rotating so so that they have a, a week of very intense leadership responsibility right? really leading all of the different dimensions of our uh, COVID-19 activity and response uh, but simultaneously uh, there are uh, dyad command center leaders that are not uh, on point uh, for a given two out of three weeks that allows them to get a lot of their uh, routine work, so-called routine work done because, you know, we're still taking care of patients who don't have COVID. We still have lots of ongoing uh, opportunities uh, for uh, continued uh, improvement and excellence in care delivery. Uh, and so those things are important. In addition, we're working with our, um, we're working with our, uh, human resources department. We've created uh, wellness and well-being programs uh, through uh, HR for both our physicians and our leaders. Uh, how do we uh, create uh, uh, opportunities to let your hair down, uh, mm -hmm. to get uh, uh, support, uh, at times counseling, um, whatever it is that is required at any given point in time. Um, but there's no, no escaping it. This is a time where those of us who have um, become senior leaders uh, test our mettle. This is where we test uh, what we're made of. And, and, um, yeah, but it's not about individual, just like our management system, it's not about individual heroics or what we've called the capes, swooping in, solving the problems. Uh, it's about uh, leaders as coaches, as, as uh, uh, facilitators of this important work. And I think even that notion um, helps create resilience and a bit more balance so that our leaders don't feel like it's all on them. And if they as individuals can't solve a problem, then they've failed. Mm -hmm. So the, the leader uh, engagement 
uh, is critical. And you talked about um, being able to respond and trading responsibilities. And that really speaks to one of the elements of the Virginia Mason production system of standard work. Right. Uh, in, in addition to standard work for our leaders in their roles, um, how big of a role do you think the Virginia Mason production system has played in Virginia Mason's response to COVID-19? Oh, it's because it's our management system. And this is key to think of it, mm -hmm. as you know, as a management system, not as just an opportunity for a point uh, and a, a improvement project. Uh, it's all pervasive. And so I would say from the minute we saw our first COVID patient on February 28th through today, where our command center is still functioning, uh, VMPS has really been the cornerstone. It's been the the approach we've taken, whether it was uh, 5Sing all of the uh, important data elements, uh, understanding all of the intersecting uh, value streams and applying cross-functional management. Uh, and, and I think very importantly, daily management has been uh, uh, essential. But we see it play out in each of our uh, work streams uh, related to our COVID response. Uh, we have a common language. Uh, we work hard to put in place new processes that are defect and waste free. We test them uh, in rapid cycle improvements. And we've done uh, many Kaizen events during the past three months as we've worked hard uh, to meet the, the challenges that we've faced. Do you think it's helped us lean into the method more and be less um less uh, uh you know process oriented in preparing for improvement do you think it was just we have our method we have a problem let's let's go address the problem immediately i think so i mean i think that um, that uh, we can't ignore the fundamentals the blocking and tackling the the foundational elements of VMPS and general management principles. Um, but the fact that we have been at it for so long and have deeply embedded the management system, uh, it's just natural. That's how we do our work. And so it quickly um, fell into place. And I think it allowed us to jump uh, a, a curve, jump the learning curve uh, in terms of how we are set up uh, also, the fact that we drill on our command center using our VMPS principles with constant PDSA approaches, uh, I think helped us uh, very early on uh, as the management system was the anchor of that work. The, many people uh, experience challenges with their supply chain uh, during the, uh, the initial parts of COVID. And I'm wondering uh, that we, we actually had a number of questions from folks about how we were able to respond to our supply chain issues uh, during this time. Well, it's a, it's a bit, it's an interesting topic and one that I've thought about and I've watched carefully uh, and all those rumors that people have heard about uh, the fragmented, uh, inconsistent supply chain, particularly at the federal level in our country, um, to my mind, they're all true. I mean, we we were uh, uh, surrounded by promises that weren't kept, by allocations of PPE, that personal protective equipment that was uh, on its way and got diverted. Um, so we had to uh, really uh, apply ourselves, and we did so very effectively. I would say that a VMPS was instrumental in our supply chain. Uh, management. Uh, many have asked me uh, how that just-in-time supply chain process worked for you guys. Right. Um, and um, I would say that uh, while, you know, I would s say that one of the things we've learned uh, is that perhaps in certain critical uh, PPE categories, we might need to raise our PAR levels mm -hmm. or the amount of, of supply we keep on hand our um, just-in-time supply chain uh, necessitated very close working relationships with our vendors mm -hmm. and assumed a deep understanding 
of our supply, excuse me, of our supply chain at all levels. And that was important. And I think yeah. um, our supply chain leadership who live and breathe VMPS every single day um, were very well prepared. And so uh, they kicked immediately into gear. Their procurement skills were amazing. And the ability to understand our suppliers, understand their challenges, the pressure they were under, uh, and to partner, uh, I think was very effective and it, it, to a great extent a result of the VMPS work that's gone on, on over many years with our supply chain. So all in all, I think it was a huge asset. And yeah, I've raised our par levels a bit, but uh, it wouldn't have changed a whole lot because when you have a pandemic of this magnitude, um, you're going to need to increase your supply chain, whether you have a just in time or a just in case approach to supply management. I remember reading uh, the daily communications where um, you had mentioned that um, although we weren't, you know, weren't as prepared, we weren't prepared for a pandemic, but because we were well, um, well along in our understanding of our supply chain, our, our our usage patterns, our car levels, we, that we were able to adapt and adjust more quickly than maybe other organizations. Exactly, and and I think speed, as we know, and, and time is a, an important mm -hmm. metric in VMPS, and was critically important uh, in responding, so that we could protect our staff, so that we could create a safe environment in which to work, and so that we could uh, actively care for. Uh, COVID patients safely. And so whether it was speed related to the supply chain or the speed with which we set up a brand new intensive care unit and repurposed existing uh, med surge space um, or many, many other things that have occurred in, in recent months, uh, I think speed was of the essence. And um, I was thankful that the organization had a culture and a management system where speed was very much part of what we focused on. I think that was an interesting takeaway from the communications that uh, we all receive daily from leadership. Again, another way of demonstrating that leadership um, engagement and visibility was just real clear communication every day was the, um, the fact that it's the Virginia Mason production system isn't one of our many approaches. So at times of crisis, people didn't have many ways to, to turn to. We had one. Uh, do you have any thoughts about that? Well, my thoughts are, as you'd expect, um, I think it's critical to have a single management system, mm -hmm. management method. Um, There's thousands of organizations that are doing lean. And uh, when you get under the hood, what that often means is they're working on a project. They did a project right. in the lab, they're doing one in the OR, but it doesn't uh, hang together as a management system and it doesn't manifest itself in daily management and daily work. And so having a single system gives you a common language, a common approach. Uh, people who don't work together very often have that very much in common. And so when you bring together um, unusual um, interfacing service lines and, uh, and with cross-functional management, I think having a single approach is invaluable. Uh, and so I'm, I'm bullish on a single management method, as you know, uh, during normal times. Uh, during, during this pandemic experience, uh, I would say it was as uh, critical as it's ever been. It's it's uh it's like that symphony, really playing to the same sheet of music. Yeah, you know, and, and so it allowed and, us to to work well together. And the alignment, a very very important, so that mm -hmm. um, when we would communicate in a certain way, people would understand their role in um, sharing that information in the communication cascade, which is very much part of creating that alignment. Uh, it's one of the things we've had to do often uh, as part of this pandemic. We cannot, I personally believe we cannot over communicate it, meaning that uh, more and more communication in new and different ways is essential uh, to keeping 
keeping everyone engaged as they need to be. Great. So we've been talking about the Virginia Mason production system or management method and how we were able to use VMPS through our COVID response. VMPS is the foundation of um, our way of achieving our strategic focus. So it's on our graphic of our strategic plan. It is the, the base that says this is the foundation that allows us to achieve. And we have pillars in our strategic plan. And one of them is our pillar of innovation. And we had a, a few questions from uh, previous clients and uh, people listening in about um, innovation. And since promoting innovation is one of our um, pillars of our strategic plan, um, can you share a few examples that you experienced about how our, um, our embracing of innovation, willingness to think differently allowed us to um, respond and adopt new ways of working quickly? Sure. Well, I've already alluded to, to some, um, but uh, I'll get into more detail. Uh, I think, you know, this uh, notion of uh, expanding our surge capacity, which was mm -hmm. one of the requests of the state of Washington, uh, being the first, um, being the first um, organization, not organization, but the first region uh, in the country uh, to stand up uh, and to have COVID patients and need to stand up the capacity. Uh, I think there was considerable concern. We needed to create more surge capacity and quickly using uh, Kaizen, using the principles of 3P and using um, innovation and idea harvesting techniques, our team quickly went to work to convert one of our med surge uh, areas to uh, new ICU beds and an isolation unit with reverse airflow and all the other requirements. This was an innovation. And this, we hadn't done this before. We hadn't in mm -hmm. you know, 24 hours expanded ICU capacity by half and uh, done so in a, in a totally new location. I think uh, VMPS really helped that to happen. Another kind of um, very different kind of example, um, which really touched so many patients and their families, as, as we know, uh, during this uh, a pandemic, we've had to be um, unusually restrictive on um, people coming into the hospital. Now, this was uh, one of those things that uh, made many of us, many of our team members, very sad because we'd be caring for patients uh, at the end of life, not just COVID patients, but patients with other illnesses, other disease processes. And the norm at Virginia Mason is we're very transparent, we're very open, we want uh, to create very special experiences, even at some of the most saddest times in one's mm -hmm. personal life. Uh, and so uh, our nurses in particular, but all members of the care team uh, were really, really um, frustrated and disappointed um, at what they saw happening. They understood our visitation policies. We were working to protect our, the community, to protect visitors, to protect staff, and to protect patients. And so we needed to make, to set limits. Um, our nurses took it upon themselves to create an entirely new program or system where they would um, meet family members they would serve as companions and educate those family members. They would screen them for any symptoms, fever, uh, other uh, areas of concern. And then they would help them be prepared to actually don uh, personal protective equipment and gowns and masks and gloves, goggles or face shields, things that you more typically uh, see, you know, healthcare providers uh, wearing so that they could be with their loved ones. And they became their personal companion. This was so touching and so remarkable. And it was a series of Kaizen events uh, and a real innovation that was in the moment spurred on by the creativity of our team members. 
Um, I remember and, reading about that and just having a tremendous sense of pride as a team member that, you know, we, we often talk about the different levels of change um, that occur. And to me, that really feels like a, what we call a level six change, you know, um, things that no one else is doing, or maybe even a level seven, yeah, things that cannot be done. Right. And um, the fact well, that people had an idea and right. we had a system that embraced that idea. I thought that was tremendous um, pride. Yeah, maybe that. it started as a level seven, things that cannot be done, yeah. and then it became a level six because we did it. Right. And then that, that being shared uh, with others suddenly opens people's potential to what can we really do in healthcare. Yeah, and That's that was exciting. picked up by a variety of publications. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm really happy about that. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about um, our journey with telemedicine and how the COVID-19 really kind of sparked us to yeah. accelerate our innovation? In fact, uh, I thought you might at some point ask me, you know, what would I do have done differently uh, yeah. uh, in those first <laughs> day, few days? Uh, and, and the answer to that question is I would have stood up and accelerated telemedicine before we ever knew that COVID existed. Mm -hmm. uh, so prior to COVID, um, over the last few years, we have felt good about where we were and where we were going uh, in our remote uh, visits, our virtu so-called virtual visits. Uh, we were doing telestroke. We were looking at tele-ICU. Uh, we had a very few, but some service lines that were doing some tele televideo consultation. But once we realized that we were really going to, and our governor's, governor made a proclamation that um, basically eliminated non-urgent care, the interpretation of that was that meant non-urgent uh, clinic visits, mm -hmm. um, we said we have to have an alternative. And we have to have an alternative because uh, patients didn't stop getting sick. Patients right. didn't stop needing us. And so, uh, again, cross-functional management, the technology, the care delivery, uh, ambulatory care, inpatient care, primary care, specialty care, everyone engaged. And with a few, within a few days' time, we had all of our providers trained. Uh, we understood that and were able to access in the pro and functionally utilize the technology. Uh, we were uh, getting paid for what we do uh, through virtual video visits uh, and began to do thousands of video visits every week. And um, that was exciting. It continues today. Interestingly, um, we thought, uh, well, interestingly, this was a huge satisfier for our patients. And they really, were appreciative and you know that's half the battle when you want your patients to really feel right. they're getting what they need and that learning that the ability to do that during these times uh, remotely was working effectively um, it was also satisfying for our, for our clinicians i know i did a video visit and seeing um, my patients at home seeing their pets seeing them in their kitchen. I mean, it, it made me think of why did we stop doing house calls? Because when you get to see your patients in, in their living context in that situation, I think it makes you more emp empathic and I think it can make you a better clinician and uh, at a minimum um, facilitate your ability to do your best for your patients. So now as we're beginning to slowly open up, uh, we began to build our scheduling templates uh, for the coming months. And we, like in primary care, made them 50-50. 50% 50 50. 50 vi video visits, 50% uh, in-person visits. Uh, what we found, interestingly, was that more like 70-30 patients wanted to come in and see their doctors. Now, interesting. I, it was very interesting. Now, I don't know if that's a short-term phenomenon um, you know, there was kind of pent up demand, people with chronic diseases and others wanted that personal connection. I think it speaks well of the physician patient relationship. Um, so that was important. 
um, and perhaps uh, it may level off at more like 50-50, but we've had to rebuild those templates now so that roughly 70% of the visits are uh, in person. And then in certain specialties or clinical situations where you do need to do a physical exam, you do need to see the patient, um, you know, virtual visits are limited in what they can provide. But I was amazed at what can be done uh, over uh, virtual visits, right. uh, e you know, even in some of the surgical specialties in terms mm -hmm. of initial uh, conversations or consultations. And so it's going to be, it's here to change. It's definitely changed the way we do our work. And I think it's going to be a big part of the future. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a good thing. That's great. And so we've been talking about the innovations and some of the things that uh, really make a lot of sense to uh, last beyond a response to the uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, do you have any concerns um, and do you have any advice for people who've seen these successes happen at time of crisis um, and moving from crisis back to a more normal operations? Um, so concerns that you have and then maybe some advice for others? Well, I think uh, what's going to be important, you know, um, is that this expression, I, I don't know if it's an expression in the UK, but in the US, uh, you need to walk, be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. And um, whereas in those first few, first few weeks, the first month or two of this pandemic, um, if, if I just think about my own energy, my own, you know, disk space in the brain, bandwidth, what we're working on. It was kind of all COVID all the time. Mm -hmm. And the rest of uh, our care delivery is more on autopilot. I think we are entering a phase where, uh, at least in this part of the, of the world, in this part of the United States, we're probably going to be, COVID's going to be with us for a long time. Mm -hmm. COVID's going to be with us uh, for many, many more months. Uh, and perhaps longer, where we're going to need to um, be able to address COVID, be able to keep our patients safe, uh, uh, um, operate within appropriate CDC and infectious uh, disease uh, guidelines and policies, and be wide open for all of the things that people want and need to see us about. And so I think that's going to be really um, Part of the challenge because we're going to need to be able, and particularly it will fall on leaders, because we're going to need to uh, shift our focus from all COVID all the time to uh, sh sharing the priorities with others' uh, priorities uh, that we uh, want and need to be working on uh, to serve our patients in our community. So I think that's, that's going to be challenging at times. Um, I also think we have uh, unleashed um, the, at Virginia Mason, we like to think that we're doing this all the time, but I think COVID has been, has um, resulted in another quantum leap in unleashing the creativity and the uh, ideas of everyone in the organization. So you, so another expression, you can't put that genie back in the bottle. And so that's now the norm. And I think we're going to have to uh, take full advantage of it. Um, and while some leaders may say, you know, it's okay, we're done with that now, let's get on with the next thing or the next body of work. Uh, I think we need to honor and respect uh, and continue to nurture uh, the ideas and creativity of our team members. And I think that's never been more uh, apparent uh, and more critical than during COVID. And now I think uh, um, we've got to continue that work. So that's the that real importance of not only engaged leaders, but engaged staff at all levels. Um, and that you had spoken about daily management a bit earlier. And it seems like a, a good, uh, um, opportunity to talk a bit more about daily management and, you know, uh, uh, each leader's ability to know their business, run their business and improve their business. Um, 
And so as part of daily management, there's the um, regular huddles with the team to talk about the work of the day. How important do you think the daily management activities um, were to uh, really helping the, uh, the burden of work, the, the fatigue factor um, for our frontline staff throughout the COVID response? Um, I think it's critical. I think it's critical in normal times and even more critical given the fast pace uh, that was required. Um, you, you asked the question, my mind can go, take this in uh, sure. a variety of different directions. Uh, I think it ties to the visibility and presence of leadership. Mm -hmm. I think uh, when there's high anxiety, uh, whether it's anxiety about uh, redesigning work or anxiety about uh, uh, ensuring that you, you as an individual are safe at work and not carrying virus home to the, your family, uh, having your leader uh, front and center with you um, says a whole lot. That sends, that sends uh, uh, huge messages uh, and I think is a huge source of support uh, and helps to build resilience in the frontline team. So I think it's it's critically important. The other, the other thing that's happened that that uh, I've alluded to, you know, the rapid pace of change during COVID, yeah. um, and uh, you and I have talked before about this, but the leadership competency related to to uh, ambiguity. And I had pay, I had staff members uh, say to me, Dr. Kaplan, it seems like you're speaking out of both sides of your mouth. Um, I don't, you know, don't like to hear that because I try to be right. consistent and try to be truthful and honest and transparent. And I said, well, what do you mean? And they said, well, you told us one thing about this yesterday and now you're telling us something totally different. And my response to that was and still is, you are right. And that's because uh, the environment today is different than it was yesterday. The CDC guidance today is different than it was yesterday. The PPE supply uh, today is in a different state or a different status than it was yesterday. And so part of what we need to be about is um, embracing that ambiguity, realizing that the things are moving fast and um, we need to adopt the adage that I'm proud of, which is I, I reserve the right to be smarter today than I was yesterday, or I reserve the right to be smarter tomorrow than I am today. I just know if I'm, if, if we are all trying to learn um, and improve and get better, um, tomorrow's going to look a little different than it does today. I think having your leader front and center on the Gemba, whether it's the senior leaders messaging and visible and present or even more, uh, or as importantly, your local leader, uh, helping to interpret, helping to translate, helping to make sense out of what doesn't seem to make sense, critically important to the ability of frontline team members to execute during times like this. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm proud to know that daily management uh, uh, is alive and well at Virginia Mason. Such a uh, important lesson. I think it's one of the first lessons that uh, I learned from you is the um, that leaders don't always have all the answers, right. and the um, working with organizations through the institute all over the world. That's one of the first things we try and help the leaders understand is you don't have to have all the answers, but a willingness to trust in a method and engage with your team together to find to find the answer that uh, makes the most sense. That's right, and you couple that with what I think of as one of the most important leadership competencies, um, which is curiosity. Mm -hmm. you know, wanting to know, um, asking why, whether it's five times or more. Um, mm -hmm. That curiosity uh, is embedded in the management system. You know, a lot of people don't understand that. A lot of people think that, right. you know, standard work, uh, cookie cutter medicine, um, mm -hmm. uh, stifles creativity and innovation. And uh, you, we've talked about this before, but nothing could be further from the truth. And, mm -hmm. um, 
and I think that uh, that's because uh, that standard work becomes a platform for for measurement, a platform for innovation, and a platform or stimulus to uh, to creativity and new ideas. Mm -hmm. I remember um, going on a, a Japan Gemba tour with you and walking into a factory and the, the sign over the front door said, inspire the next. And uh, you turned to me and said, that's an important message. You know, are we doing that? So um, I, I really appreciate that reflection. You know, we, um, we have a, a platform at Virginia Mason of respect called Respect for People. And, um, you know, in thinking about engaging in the role of the leader, that's, that's a, a way of showing respect. But how have you seen our respect for people come forward and really uh, shine during this, uh, during this time? Well, I think it, again, like our management system and respect for people, as you know, is foundational to our management system. Mm -hmm. It's very much part of our, um, what we call our BMPS house. Um, I think during times of stress, respect sometimes uh, goes by the wayside and mm -hmm. or is not top of mind. I'm proud that that rarely happened at Virginia Mason. I won't say that it never happened during this uh, uh, pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what the Respect for People framework does for us is even when um, in the heat of the moment, uh, something might not be um, as respectful as we would like it to be, uh, it, gives, it gives an individual a framework um, a foundation or a basis for which to provide feedback in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, I get where you're coming from, but um, I felt disrespected in how you said that. Um, that is much more easily said than, um, than you know, years ago. And, and that feedback in the moment is critical. And I think it, it actually um, as opposed to uh, creating more conflict, which is, I think, the fear, it actually helps resolve conflict constructively uh, and respectfully, and that's important. I think in other areas that come to mind, uh, some of this cross-functional management that I talked about earlier, um, uh, one of the respectful behaviors is walk in their shoes. Right. And uh, when you actually display the intersecting value streams and workflows and come to understand uh, the colleagues' um, processes and, 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 and uh, uh, body of work, it makes it so respectful, it's so honoring, it's so valuing, and I think it furthers uh, the effectiveness and the execution of, of cross-functional management. Uh, daily management is really an exercise and daily respect and uh, listening to understand, which is another uh, respect for people behavior. Um, it's one that I'm working on. How do, how do I be a more active listener? How do I um, really um, use humble inquiry, um, genuinely wanting to know uh, and better understand another person's rea reality, another person's work? And so uh, I think respect for people is pretty much all pervasive at Virginia Mason and doesn't mean we don't have pockets of, or uh, episodes of disrespect, but I think having that basis and foundation to stand on um, is very, very helpful. And as I sent out a, um, you haven't asked me about it, but I'll bring it up. Sure. Uh, we're talking today, uh, a few days before the actual webinar, but we are still uh, in our community and in communities around the world uh, coming face to face with systemic racism and uh, the issues that that um, raises. And uh, as I uh, and others are trying to make sense of this, to communicate to our team members, um, I've received so many responses from our team members, uh, and many have referred to respect for people. Uh, 
and, ref and, and referred to how appreciative they are that they're in an organization where they're able to share their thinking uh, and even if it's divergent thinking um, from what you know seems to be uh, today's quote politically correct uh, uh, attitude and so um, we run and lead complex enterprises with lots of people and uh, we have to find ways to honor uh, uh, what's happening around us, what's happening in communities, other people's life experiences, uh, and respect uh, everyone at the same time. So it's it's an interesting dynamic. So, but I, I call that to... respect for people principles. Oh, exactly. And I, I think uh, that's one of the first things I thought about. Where, where, where is my work with respect for people and what are the um, opportunities? And it's the walking in the shoes of others and really just taking time to listen um, before making judgments. So really appreciate um, you sharing that. We have um, just one final question from our friends in the United Kingdom. And um, they've been as excited as we have been about uh, making some gains, um, creating some wins as they say over there. And their concern is moving forward what advice would you give to being able to lock in the winds and, and not go backwards, but actually keep moving forwards? Well, I, I, I think about that in, in many different ways. And um, uh, first and foremost, I come back to staying true to our method. And so uh, whether they were formal Kaizen events, you know, RPIWs, Kaizen events, uh, a daily Kaizen, uh, where we've made these, these innovations, where we have seen those new wins uh, precipitated by the COVID crisis, I think we have to hold ourselves accountable to holding the gains. And so that then translates to me to things like our 30, 60, 90 day follow-ups, mm -hmm. uh, sponsors of work where we have used formal Kaizen activity staying connected to that work um, and realizing where we've made progress, where we've maybe slid a little bit and how do we, um, how do we keep moving forward? So, um, you know, this inch wide and mile deep, um, it's a rare work process that is improved with a single Kaizen event. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's, you know, in a very planful, organized, deliberate fashion, um, codifying and, and harnessing the, the events, the learnings, the innovations, the improvements that are made, and then um, using our accountability uh, approaches uh, to ensure that they are uh, sticking and that where we've slid or where we have opportunities for further evolution that we have follow on events. I think that's critically important. The other thing that I would mention, uh, and uh, this came up earlier, I think, uh, you know, we are, we're very much a learning organization at Virginia Mason. What that means, and the management system is so conducive to that and has really propelled that, is it's, you know, continuous PDSA cycles. So we are constantly rapid cycle improving and then going back and improving it some more. Measurement, improvement. Uh, and um, as part of a learning institution, we uh, are also somewhat academic. And uh, you know, many of our clinicians and other leaders uh, publish frequently and are very academic. And so uh, through our Center for Health Services Research, uh, we are coordinating uh, the academic pursuits of many of our team members who are writing articles. Uh, there's actually, I believe, a book that's being uh, considered um, because we want to contribute. Uh, we learn uh, best when we're sharing and receiving feedback. And so we will be putting out a series of, of articles on a variety of topics. I've already through interviews and others uh, uh, contributed several where uh, you may see them in 
variety of areas in the industry uh, press uh, in coming weeks. Uh, but I think it's a commitment to uh, capture the learnings and to build on them. They're not stagnant. You know, the learnings are the learnings, but um, but I think they're they're just the platform for the next improvement, for the next innovation. Well, and I think that's the exciting thing about Virginia Mason is we are always learning. And one of the real values of having the Virginia Mason Institute is we now have a way of sharing that information more deliberately. So all of these articles and things, um, just for our listeners to know that uh, the Virginia Mason Institute.org is the location where we'll keep you up to date on things like this and this webinar and, and other things. But I think it, it just uh, proves the point, Gary, that uh, better never stops. Well, that's, right. that's been one of our, you know, taglines for a long time. And, and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, it meets meaningful when team members are repeating it, you know, and they, mm -hmm. they say after an improvement event, and this was a fabulous example of better never stops. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's how, what we believe in, uh, and uh, I know uh, most of our, our listeners are also engaged in uh, their uh, regular daily improvement. And uh, I wish everyone the best. Great. Well, Gary, thank you so much for your time. Uh, this is such an important time in the world's history and, and there's so much learning. And I just really appreciate your willingness to share some of the learnings from Virginia Mason with our audience. So uh, have a great rest of the day and thank you so much. My pleasure, Chris. Thanks. It's always good to be with you. All right, take care. You too. Today was an amazing day to have a conversation about an organization's use of their management method and the importance of leadership in uh, leading through the crisis. Uh, we wanna make sure that you are um, well aware that this session has been recorded and it will be posted on our website, the virginiamasoninstitute.org Make sure also to check your inbox for a link to um, access the recording in the question and answer uh, transcript from this session. We'll also love to hear from you and get your feedback. And maybe there's a follow up question you'd like to ask. We'd love to hear from you. This is part one of a series in leader leadership through the crisis interviews. So we want to make sure that you have a chance to follow along. So um, check your inbox, make sure that you see the announcement for the next webinar in our Leadership Through Crisis interview series. And uh, stay in touch. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you soon.